Good morning. Good morning. Uh, that was a lot of a lot of pressure, Jim. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know that you're actually going to learn anything this morning. So let's, let's, let's get started. Uh, this talk is called Elixir for Beginners. Uh, my name is Aaron Patterson, and usually when I'm at a conference, I like to do a thing. Uh, I like to give a Friday hug, but today is Saturday, so we can't really do that. And I think there is something a bit more special that we should do today. Well, I also, another problem is I forgot to bring my selfie stick, so I apologize. When we take selfies today, we're gonna have to do manual, manual selfie stick. Uh, but th there's something more important than doing a Friday hug today, which is uh, related to Jim. <laughs> and <laughs> so, so uh, I don't know if all of you know this, but recently was Jim's birthday. So I think that we should all sing happy birthday for him today. So, uh, right, let, let's do this, all right? All right, right? <laughs> I can see his face. All right, let's go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jim. Happy birthday to you. Ah! <laughs> I think, he, I think he told some of the other speakers not to do that, but he did not tell me. <laughs> anyway, I have, I have cats. I own some cats. This is one of my cats, uh, Choo Choo. Uh, she sits in my office frequently, and my wife does not like her, so we only have one photo <laughs> today. Uh, this is my other cat. He's a bit more famous. This is Gorbachev, Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunder Horse. Uh, here is another, another photo of him. And I, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering, do any of you recognize this photo? Um, this is a photo of my cat. I know that at least, like, at least five of you recognize this photo. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> anyway, I really, enjoyed, I really enjoyed the presentation about, uh, I, presentations about, I, um, Hardware, hardware hacking and car hacking yesterday, and I want to share a little bit of hardware hacking that I've been doing, and it's, it's this, it's my pager I built myself. <laughs> so I'm getting, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm quitting the iPhone to use a pager that I built for myself. <laughs> anyway, I work, for a, I work for a very small startup company called GitHub. Uh, <laughs> you may have heard of it. I, <laughs> You can use our website to manage code socially if you don't know about it. Um, I really enjoy using Git, but I do not want to force push it onto you. Uh, <laughs> yes! <laughs> First thing in the morning. It's all downhill from here, I'm sorry. Um, so, <laughs> unfortunately, I, so I'm, on, I'm on the Ruby core team. <laughs> And I'm also on the Rails core team. <laughs> so, so what does that make me at, at an Elixir conference? Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you exactly what that makes me. It makes me extremely nervous. <laughs> I think that I thought of myself, like, this is, a, this is one of the most difficult presentations I've had to prepare ever. Like, it was extremely difficult for me because I just kept thinking to myself, well, you know, I'm, I'm just going to look like this on stage. <laughs> so... What like I just I kept thinking what qualifications do I have or what can I teach what can I teach an audience of obviously expert elixir programmers when I'm just a beginner, so what what qualifications do I have to be up here on stage and the only thing that I could think of is that I'm friends with Jose, <laughs> so I texted him and I said hey I'm really like I'm really nervous I don't know if you can read this I said I'm really really nervous please give me some quotes to say on stage and he says here you go and then types in quote characters. <laughs> so I said, I'm going, to use, I'm going to use these quotes. So I'm, I'm quoting here. <laughs> these, these extremely profound <laughs> quotes from Jose Valim. So I, I, yes, I quoted, I quoted Jose. I decided to quote him. But uh, since, we're, since we're at an Elixir conference, I think this is wrong. I think single quotes would be much more appropriate because Jose is quite the character. I thought about that 
that one for a while. <laughs> anyway, so I, I was trying to learn, like, learn more Elixir. I read a lot of the Phoenix source code. Uh, this is one thing I do when I'm learning programming languages. I read a lot of source code, and I noticed that I noticed that there are a lot of EX files, or as I like to call them, the the X the X files. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's get serious here today. So this presentation is called Elixir, Elixir for Beginners because I am a, I am a beginner. Uh, and I thought to myself, like, whenever I, whenever I work with a new programming language, I like to think, what makes this language special? So I kept thinking to me, like, what, or thinking to myself, what makes, what makes Elixir special? And there's a, there's a test that I like to do on programming languages. I always implement, I always implement the same thing on a programming language just so I can learn it learn it better, and we're going to do this, I, I do this with every language, and we're going to do it today. We're going to develop a programming language that I like to call Tenderlang. Uh, so th this is a brand new, brand new programming language. But this, this language, it's um, essentially equivalent to Elixir. So we're, 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 going, we're going to develop this programming language, and we're going to compare it, we're going to compare it to Elixir, and we're going to do this, we're going to develop, develop this language using only one one construct, and that is the lambda. So I use this. I use this in this test in every language I come across. And the reason I do this is I, I want to know, like, I, so I want to learn a language, but I don't have much time. Uh, and I think to myself, well, what is the one thing that I could learn in your language in order for me to get endorsement on LinkedIn? And I, <laughs> I think that I think that the lambda is the key. That is the key. If you learn the lambda, you can get endorsed on LinkedIn. And I'm gonna we're gonna teach you why today. So the reason we're gonna go through this exercise is uh, one. I want to understand how a language works. So we're, I want to understand how Elixir works. And I also like I also want to develop a language with all of you together today. So we can all develop a programming language. We can do that. Uh, I also want to do this so that we can figure out exactly like what makes uh, what makes Elixir special, and I also figured that there are some some people like me in the audience who are also new to Elixir and want to get endorsement on LinkedIn. So by the end of this presentation, we should be able to endorse each other on LinkedIn for Elixir. So we'll do that. Um, but I want to share I want to share my dream with you. So, so I have a dream, a dream programming language that I've wanted to implement and never been able to. And Elixir is the very first programming language where I've been able to come close to this dream. And what I want to do is I want to build a completely distributed programming language, like completely distributed. Uh, and to give you an idea of what I mean by completely distributed, like take this, take this code for example. So we have, this is just some simple code. Uh, typically, if you're doing a distributed program, you have to like send some data. You might create a new gen server, and you're sending data to that server. Um, but what I want to do is I want to say, well, where does like where does this if statement execute? What if what if primitive language constructs like if what if they were executed on some node in the in the system? What if you couldn't predict where any of these things were executed? They were just distributed across a whole bunch of machines. So I want to get it down to these tiny, the, the smallest language constructs possible and distribute those across computers. So when I say completely distributed, I really, really mean like the entire language is completely distributed. So we're going to attempt to do that today with um, Tenderlang. <laughs> But we'll, we're going to start off. We're going to start off small. So let's let's build Tenderlang. Let's do this. Uh, as we go as we go along, I'm going to create some language constructs, and then we're going to compare them. We're going to compare them with Elixir, and we're going to translate them to Elixir sometimes. So we'll we'll be mixing Tenderlang and Elixir as we go along. And the reason we're going to do this is because um, Tenderlang is not very easy to read. And Elixir is much easier to read. So as we as we implement aspects of Tenderlang, we make we we will convert them to Elixir. So the first thing we want to do is um, we we have nothing. We have a function here. This is all we have. Uh, and what I would really really like to I'd like to implement real functions. And if we think about functions, a uh, function is just a, a lambda like this, except it has a name. So we can give it a name. We just want to give it a name. Now. 
unfortunately, we can't actually execute this code in Tenderlang yet because we don't have assignments. They don't exist in our language. It does not exist. So uh, how, can we, how can we implement an assignment in our language? Well, we can pass parameters. Uh, we can pass parameters to a function. So in that way, we can actually do assignments. So here, here is an example. There are no local variables in here anywhere. <laughs> So we just, we just create a function and we pass in, we pass in a parameter to the function, we're able to print it out and there, this is how we can implement an assignment. So for example, like we're, we're only using a lambda here to do an assignment. So for an example, we have maybe a multiple assignment. We have A equals 10, B equals 11, we add those together. We're able to do that here, do multiple assignments and we can even, uh, if we want to, we can even combine them and collapse them like this. So we can say like, let's pass in multiple parameters. What I think is interesting about this construct is let's take some, let's take some real Elixir code, well, most, mostly real Elixir code. For example, we have this, this code. I found kind of this on the internet, so you can go search for this. We have, a, we have a function that we're creating a user and we have a date of birth and we're parsing those. And if we rearrange this a little bit, if we take those two parameters that are at the bottom and kind of move the text around, we could rearrange the order such that it looks like this. So you, this may look more familiar to you. You have a with, a with statement. So we could actually think of that with statement as a lambda that we're just passing in, we're passing in values. So we're doing pretty well at this point. We have, we have two things in, in Tenderlang implemented now. We have equals and we have with. So we can do these. Uh, but with, with isn't very useful without functions, so let's, let's continue on to, do, to actually implement named functions. So let's say we have, we have a named function. We, we can do an assignment and give it a name. Now that we can do assignments, we can give functions names. Uh, and the reason that this, this tender line works is because we could actually rewrite it as this. Uh, this, is, this is pure, pure tender line. <laughs> You know, I didn't, I didn't think about that while I, was present, while I was coming up with this talk. I should probably rename the language. Uh, anyway, so that, that code at the top there, that's our, that's our Elixir code. Now, unfortunately, if we try to actually execute that Elixir code, it's not going to work. So if we run it, we'll get an exception saying, hey, it's, it, your code is outside a module. We need to wrap this inside of a module. So in order to translate our, our language into Elixir, we need to implement modules. And modules are really just a, a, a bag of functions. It's another thing with a bunch of functions inside, a named thing with functions inside, and we can actually implement that with a function as well. So we can define functions inside of a function. So we can give a function a name and define some functions inside the function, and then we can return those two functions as an array back out. So we need to be able to access those functions inside the module somehow, and we'll do that by returning an array. So we can do this here. Uh, we can even implement private functions this way because we don't have to export all of the lambdas. We can say, okay, we're just gonna define one inside here and we won't return it. And we can, our lambdas can use it, but clients of our module cannot. So uh, we could actually translate this, this particular code into uh, Elixir that looks like this. We have a private function here as well. Uh, so, in Tenderlang, we just write this, this particular code. Now we have, we have some more, we've introduced some more language constructs here from Elixir. Uh, we now have uh, assignments and we have with and we can do def module and we can do uh, def p and we can do def as well, but we were using a few language constructs from Elixir that we haven't implemented yet. So those, that code isn't pure, pure Tenderlang, it's only, it's only partially. So we, we have a bit of things to do here. We need to implement lists because uh, we were returning a list from that module. We need to implement numbers. We were using numbers and printing those out. We need to implement strings. We also need to implement uh, arithmetic. So we, we had to cheat a little bit because we're, we're using all these from Elixir. We, we, don't, we haven't actually implemented those yet. So let's work on lists next. And the way I want to, the way I want to define a list is we're going to define a list as a, a bunch of cells. This is a general outline of our data structure for a list. So we'll have a bit of data and then we'll point, we'll have two cells. One is a bit of data, the other side of that cell points to the next one. So we ha essentially have some, si some kind of linked list. 
and we'll call each of these cells, we'll call them a con cell. So if we wanted to represent the list uh, one, two, three, four, then we would store it like this. So we have one and then a pointer down to the next two, et cetera, et cetera. So we need some kind of function that ties two values together. So how can we do that? We only have one tool and our tool is a lambda. So the way we can do that is we implement a function like this. This is our cons function. The cons function is, okay, I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say it in a confusing way and then I'll say it in a less confusing way. The cons function is a function that returns a function which takes a function and calls a function. <laughs> it's true, it's true, look at this. So we have, we have one function, this cons, cons cell, it takes two things and it returns a lambda. And we can, we can actually uh, call, pass in a lambda to that lambda and it'll return our values to us. And we can, we're gonna, don't worry, we're gonna see this in action with some diagrams. Uh, but we can rewrite this in, it's okay to write this in Elixir because we know we can rewrite it in Tenderlang like this. So it looks, looks nice, doesn't it? Yes, looks very nice. So uh, we're still using head, which we're not allowed to use, we shouldn't be using that. And we're still using an array, which we're not supposed to be using, we shouldn't be using that. But uh, we can write, rewrite part of it like this. So the way that our cons function actually works is, uh, so, like I said, we return a function that takes a function, and we call a function. Uh, but lambdas aren't just functions. When we return that function as a bit of data, it's actually got something tied to it. It's got an environment tied to it. So let's say we have this, this function here, this function m at the bottom. That's up there in our code. Uh, when we return that function, it captures its surrounding environment. So we're not just returning a function, we're returning a function and an environment. So this particular environment has the values x, the variables x, and the variables y, and they're tied to the values 10 and 11 because that's, that's how we called it, right? Now we're gonna pass in a function to that at some point, this function m, and our new, this, this function that we returned is gonna call the function m with those values x and y. So this con cell is all of this stuff put together. It's this function along with the environment that it captured. So now we need to get those, we need to be able to extract those values and the way we do that is we'll implement a, we'll implement a function called car and this function calls a function with a function and returns the first parameter passed in. Okay, so this one, we'll take the result of the con cell, we'll pass that into car, and that will give us back our, our very first value that's tied in there. So if we do this, uh, we're, we're gonna visualize how this works using the previous diagram. So the con cell return points to an environment uh, that contains the values 10 and 11. We pass that into the car function. So that's our cell, this function goes in, this FNM is our cell. We call that, we pass in a function to that, uh, this function calls it with 10 and 11, which goes into our anonymous function. Now our anonymous function only returns the left-hand side of that x, uh, so we get the value 10 back out. And we can, define, we can define another function that does the same thing, but it just does it for the right-hand side. So this is exactly the same thing, we just do it uh, from the right-hand side. So we'll store the environment, or we'll look at the environment, pass in a function, and we just return y. So at this point, we're actually able to implement lists. We can put together a bunch of values and take them apart. So yay, we have a list there. That's great, that's great. Now, if we squint hard enough at this code, it looks very, very similar to the way we might write Elixir lists right here. So we have, what's, we have a list here that looks very much like ours, and what's neat is this bar method is actually called a cons operator. So you can kind of see where we're getting these names from. So what else, I, the other thing I think is very cool about this is uh, Erlang lists are actually just con cells. So the way that these lists are actually implemented in Erlang is via con cells, just like we implemented today, maybe a slightly different implementation, not using lambdas like we are, but uh, they're referred to in the same way. So we've built the same data structure completely on our own. So we have, we have Tenderlang, which is actually implemented on top of Elixir, which is implemented on top of Erlang, and we're able to understand the underlying implementation of Erlang because we implemented our own on top of it. What else is neat about this is we can understand why when somebody says, 
oh, if we're accessing a list, if we want to access the nth element of that list, why list access is O n. So this means that if we want to get the nth element of the array, we have to go down n con cells in order to get that, in order to get that value. Now this, is, this, is, uh, this performance characteristic is actually uh, contrary to, say, a language like Ruby where accessing an element of an array is constant time. This is ON where it's constant time in Ruby, so it's possibly faster to do this in Ruby, but if we know this particular performance characteristic, we can design our code such that it's performant. Uh, another interesting thing about this way of building up lists is, let's say we want to share a list. Let's say we want to implement the list 1, 2, 3, 4, and also 6, 5, 3, 4, for example. Well, in a language like Ruby, we may actually have to copy the list. So we would actually have to contain, maintain two copies of that list. Whereas in a functional language like uh, uh, Elixir, we can actually just point into the middle of it and share parts of the list. So we actually get a 25% memory reduction because of this particular optimization. And functional data structures uh, take advantage of this fact. This is something that you should take advantage of in your code as well. Another neat thing about this is, given these types of functional data structures, we can actually do really neat GC tricks. So Erlang's garbage collector, why am I, I thought this was Elixir for beginners, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about Erlang's garbage collector. This is how I look at languages, I'm sorry. <laughs> so imagine, imagine your stack, your memory, uh, imagine your memory, your heap as a stack. Okay, it's, it's a stack of values. And each time we create a new object, we're moving down that stack. So we say hello, we allocate hello, we allocate world, we allocate a function, and that function points to hello and world. This is an example of our con cells. So we're, we're doing these allocations and it's moving down the stack. What's interesting is, if you think about building an array, if you think about building a functional array, all the values that get stored in the array have to be allocated before the array is allocated because they have to go into the array somehow. They had to be there before they could get into the array. So what's neat is that all of these references point back up the stack. Our allocations go down and our references always point up. So what that means is we can actually implement a GC that's only scanning in one direction. Excuse me, scanning in one direction. <laughs> Now, uh, Erlang's GC actually implements, actually implements multiple strategies for garbage collection, but that one that I just described to you is, is one of them. Uh, and you can actually build high-performance real-time GCs using this strategy, and this is one thing I think is really, really cool about the language. Anyway, we're, we're, getting, we're getting a little off the rails here. <laughs> Sorry, I had, to throw in some, I had to throw in some jokes. Come on. All right. So back, back to tender language. So we have lists. Uh, we have lists, and you may, you may have noticed something is a little bit missing from the Elixir version of the list. The thing that's missing is we need to actually have that empty, that empty one at the end there. Uh, so if we want to iterate over a list in Elixir, it's very, very easy. Uh, we just implement uh, two functions like this, one to handle the empty, empty part of the list, and the other one to take it apart and uh, iterate down the list. Now, unfortunately, there's no way for us to do this in, in uh, our language yet. We need to, we need to add, add some Boolean logic because this is actually just um, kind of hiding some Boolean logic. It's, the language is doing that logic for us. It's saying, if the list is empty, we're going to call this other function. Otherwise, we're going to call this other function. So we need to be able to do that too, and we can't yet. So, so far, we have assignments uh, with def module, def p, def and lists, uh, but we still need to do numbers, strings, arithmetic, and Boolean logic. So let's, I want to do this, I want to be able to iterate down these lists, so let's do Boolean logic next. Uh, so if we're going to implement Boolean logic, how can we do this using only lambdas? So let's, let's take a look at some Boolean code here. We have a method and we have a condition and a true part and a false part. So we have three parameters, essentially, a conditional, a truth, and a false. So if we were actually going to write this, how, how might we write a function that would represent a conditional like this? 
Given a, given a Boolean and a true branch and a false branch, how would we write a function that would actually, um, how would we write a function that could do this branching code for us? And the answer lies in how we define true and false. So we get to define what true is and what false is. And if we define true and false in a convenient manner, then we can implement an if statement. So this is our, this is our convenient manner. The way this works is we, we have a function that returns a function. And if you call the truth one, the truth one returns a function that captures the environment and returns A, it returns the first thing. So our untruth, I can't use false, I can't use true and false because those are elixir things. Uh, untruth, what it does is it just returns the second thing. Okay, so this is, our, this is our true and our false values. Now if we define if in a convenient way to use these values, then we can, use a, we can have a branching structure. So for example, here we have, we have our, this is ify, <laughs> not if, because I, I can't do if. Uh, this is a function that takes three functions. So it takes our conditional C, and it passes true and false. It calls C with true, and then it calls the, return, the resulting uh, value with false. So if the conditional is true, then the true branch is returned, but if the conditional is false, then the false branch is returned. Because you remember our true branch returns the first thing where our false branch returns the second. So we can run this in IEX, and you'll see here we can say, hey, truth, give me the true or the value. We ask iffy for a true or a false value, and you can see if we pass in truth, we get true, false, we get false. So normally we'd want to have a block associated with this because we want to do multiple things. I don't want to just return true or false. It's not very helpful. We want to execute some code based on our conditional. So we can do this. We can see this if statement in action here. So we have a Boolean, our use Boolean function. Uh, we pass in a Boolean to the if statement, and then we can output true or false depending on which side of the Boolean is called. Now, you'll see there at the very bottom, since we return a, well, almost the bottom, since we return a function from the if statement, we actually have to call that function. So you'll see that dot, dot parentheses there. Uh, but you can see here our untruth, we, we have to call it right there. We have to call our branch. Um, but now we have true and false. We can pass in true and it prints out true. We pass in false, untruth and it prints out false. So the language that we're using actually doesn't need to support if anymore. So we don't, we don't, need, we don't need you if. We can build our own. And in fact, one reason that I really, really love Elixir is if you go read the documentation, there's, there's a beautiful statement that I love. This, this is so nice. If you look at the documentation for if, it says, uh, if and unless aren't special language constructs. So it's not a thing. If, if and unless aren't actually defined in Elixir, they're defined in terms of macros. So since we're able to define our own if, we can imagine how it might be defined in Elixir. Next thing we need to do is look at iteration. So we, we've got our Boolean logic, but I want to iterate over a list. And we need, to, we need a way to uh, detect when we're at the end of a list. So we want our list to be able to store any object, anything, and we need a way to detect whether or not we've hit the end of the list so that we can stop iteration. So the way we'll do this is we'll encode our list in a convenient way. The way we'll encode them is we'll start out with, we'll start with false, so we'll say, okay, uh, you can think of this false value as representing, are we, at the, are we at the end of the list yet? Okay, and at the very end of the list, we store true. So if we come across a false value, then we know we're going to access the next element, that's our data element, and then we go look at the false value. So we say, is this the list end? Uh, if not, we'll access the data, and then we keep doing this. Is this the list end? If not, we'll access the data. Is this the list end? Yes, it is the list end, so we stop iteration. So we can think of this true, true at the bottom as Elixir's empty, empty brackets. So we need to be able to define this, these true, true at the end here. We'll think of that as our null. So we'll define null like this. We'll put together truth and truth. So those are our two, that is our null value. And we'll say, okay, I, I need to know, I need a predicate method to def decide whether or not we have, we have hit the end of the list. So we'll define null as is null like this. We're just going to get the very first element and ask whether or not that's truth. So cons and car are more of primitives for dealing with our list. So we'll define a few more functions. We'll define pair. 
we need to prepend truth to everything, so we'll define, or untruth, so we'll define pair, and that just prepends untruth to our data values. Uh, head just gets that first value, and then tail gets the second value from there. So we're, de we're defining head and tail from Elixir in this particular case. And now we can actually define each like this. We'll say, okay, we're gonna define each. It takes a list, we have an iterator function. The iterator just goes through and does exactly how we described. We say, does this, are we at false? If no, get the data, et cetera. We can move, we can move through the list like this. Now we can actually use it, and if we run this code, it'll actually output uh, one, two, three, just like it looks like. So we're able to define this iteration. I'm completely comfortable writing this code now because I was able to define it myself, and we can actually quite easily uh, translate this into pure Tenderlang code, and this is what it looks like. It's very easy <laughs> to read. Now, <laughs> I thought to myself, okay, maybe, oh, maybe it's not so easy to read. Okay, it's kind of ugly. So I thought, well, I'm on, I'm on Elixir 1.6 now. I've got mix format. So I ran it through the formatter, and now it is much easier to read. <laughs> now, unfortunately, unfortunately, it still has one thing. There's one, there's one ugly part about this code. There's one really ugly part. Anybody spot it? Anyone see the problem? Okay, I'll sh I will point it out to you in case it is not obvious. There is an equal sign right there. There is an equal sign. It is disgusting. No other equal signs in this entire code. We have a local variable. <laughs> what is this? So the problem, the problem with our code is we have to have this local variable because our language doesn't actually support recursion. We have to define a local variable so that we can recurse on this function. We have to be able to call itself. So we have, so far we have all of these things. We have assignment and width, def module, all of these things. Uh, but we're missing recursion. We need, we need numbers, we need strings, arithmetic and recursion. So let's, let's define recursion. Now, this is the point in the presentation <laughs> I, found, I found a very appropriate tweet for this presentation. Uh, every functional language tutorial, okay, we're going to talk about currying. Currying is when you break down a function, scrolls down, and you see this gibberish. <laughs> so this, this, is, this is the point in this presentation where I'm going to do a lot of hand-waving right now. We're going to define recursion, and I am not going to tell you how we're doing it. I'm just going to show you this is recursion. Here it is. This is it. This is it. This is, this is I, I will, uh, we could go through and define this, but it would take all morning and you would be bored to tears. What, the, what this is, this is, the <laughs> this is the Y combinator. And the way that this thing works, I'm just gonna describe to you how you can think about it. If you think about recursion, you can think about your function as jumping to the top and, and looping over and over like this. Think about it as jumping up. Now, if we look at the Y combinator, the way that this thing works is we're passing our cell we create a function that passes this function in, and from that function that we created, we call back into this one, and this one is infinitely calling itself over and over. So you can think about it as, rather than looping up and down, we're kind of falling forward as a wave through our code, right? Think about it as a wave through your code implementing recursion rather than as a loop. So we don't need to understand this code, just think about it as a wave rather than a loop. That's how I like to think. So now we can do, we implement a partial implementation of our each function. It looks like this. So we pass in a partial function, which is the Y combinator I showed you earlier. And that allows us to implement, actually implement recursion without doing any assignments. You'll see there's no assignments in here whatsoever. And we're able to recurse. So we're able to do iteration now. And if we, we I am, quite comfortable writing this code in Elixir because, as I said, we can very simply rewrite it as this. Uh, you can see right there, our program is that line, that one up there, and we're very happy because there are no equal signs anywhere. We're able to create arrays and loop over them with no equal signs, and I have to say, I, I've, already, I've already spoiled this, but from yesterday's, uh, yesterday's presentation, 
I, from Dave Thomas, I, have to, I had to add a quote. I've come to hate local variables, and if I can get rid of them, I'll have better code. Dave Thomas. So you can see here, there are no assignments. So this is obviously better code. <laughs> this, is, this is pure tenderlang. And I, I don't... <laughs> I don't know, so I don't know if you can tell. I don't know if you, you can tell by looking at me or not, but I, I, I am definitely beaming with pride. <laughs> Actually, I, I went to, you know, I went to an Elixir or an Erlang conference a few weeks ago, and I have to say it's not nearly as fun as an Elixir conference, and the reason it's not as fun is because I felt like I felt like all of the presenters at the Erlang conference were just phoning it in. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> this is all I think about all day. Like, I can't stop. I can't stop. Please help, help. All right. So we have all of these things. We've implemented all of these. And I think, like, I really think at this point, I really think at this point we can, we can say that this is enough to be endorsed on LinkedIn. I really think so. But, but we're going to finish up. We're going to finish up a little bit here. We're, we need to do numbers, strings, and arithmetic. I just want to tackle these, these things and then finish up with our language. So we're going to implement numbers, and we have to do that with functions as well. So we're going to encode numbers in a special way. The way we're going to do that is we're going to have a function that applies a function a certain number of times. So we can represent the number 0 with this top function, and it applies the function f 0 times. And I put an underscore in there so that we don't get warnings. Uh, 1, we apply the f function once. 2, we apply the f function twice. 3, we apply it three times, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'll prove to you that this is uh, 3. This represents 3 by passing in a function and printing out uh, hello. So if we run this, if we run this code, uh, we'll get hello printed out three times. So this, we know that this represents the number three. Now this is kind of a pain. We don't want to type out f f f f f for every single number because there are a lot of numbers. <laughs> so it'd be more convenient if we were to define some mathematical operations. And if we think about addition. Uh, all addition is is taking two of those numbers, which we're applying. So we say we apply the number a, whatever a is. We apply, if we want to add that a to b, then we apply a and we apply b that many times. So we can define addition this way. We say, OK, well, we're going to apply a, a we're going to apply the function f a times, and then we're going to apply the function b b times. So we just define 0 and 1, and then we can add 1 to 1 to get 2, and then we can add 2 to 1 to get 3, et cetera, et cetera. So now we can get rid of those disgusting integers from our, <laughs> our pure tender love code. And this is our program now. We have one, two, three, no, no gross integers in our code whatsoever. We're able, to, we're able to define all of this and print it out. Now, unfortunately, when we run this code, uh, we get some problems, uh, which is this. It just doesn't work. And the reason is because since we have represented all of our integers as functions, we can't really print them out. So, okay, fine. <laughs> I will, fine, Elixir, that's fine. So we, we've implemented all of these. We've got recursion numbers. We added recursion and numbers and arithmetic. And there's one thing left to add, and that is strings. But I, I want to punt on this one. And the reason I'm going to punt on this one is because we've already done numbers, and aren't strings just a list of numbers anyway, really? So we'll just say that we've implemented that. That's fine. So that, I, think, I think we're good. <laughs> I think we're good. So we've, we've accomplished this. Tenderlying is accomplished. Now, we have one more thing, one more thing that I want to add to this language, which was the part that I talked about at the very beginning of the presentation, which is I want to have a completely distributed language. So we're going to add one more thing, which is we're going to implement a distributed version of cons. So we want to implement this con cell, but we're going to do it in a distributed manner. So rather than using uh, returning functions, we're going to start returning PIDs. This is how we'll do it. We'll say, OK, I'm going to, rather than uh, returning a lambda from this, we're now going to spawn a node. And this node is going to contain x and y. 
And it's always going to give us back those X and Ys. So we create this loop at the bottom that keeps sending out X and Ys to anybody, anybody who comes along. Now we can actually implement this, this process. Our node spawn can actually store that same information that our lambda could store. So we're able to replace that lambda with a node. Now we can implement cons and car in a way that's aware of dealing with these nodes. And we'll say, OK, well, we're just going to send, send a value there and say, hey, I want, I want your value. Give me your values back. So the, the node will send its values back, and we're able to return the left side and the right side uh, just, like, just like we could with lambdas. Now, unfortunately, you, saw, you, you may have noticed in the code earlier, but we, we only have one node here, which is ourself. And this isn't, this isn't very distributed, since we're just talking to ourselves, something I like to do a lot at home. Uh, <laughs> We, we need to distribute this, so we implement a version called random node, and this random node just selects from nodes that we're connected to. Any random node, we're going to connect to you and store a con cell on you. So I've actually implemented, I ran this, this code. I have, a, I have a server running in the background called, I think called Alice. This one might be Bob. Yeah, this one's Bob. So you can see we, we actually connect to Alice, and then we're going to say, I'm going to create a con cell on a random, a random node. Uh, and this one is on Alice. These keep going to Alice. This one is local. So we can keep creating these con cells. Every time we create a con cell, it connects to a different server and stores the con cell on that server. Then we can actually get values back out of them. Come on, Aaron, type. I was using the laptop, com laptop keyboard, and these things are terrible. I hate these laptop keyboards. Anyway, we're able to get the value back out just like that. So, completely works and we're able to store these, store these values anywhere on our network. And one, I, I don't know whether or not all of you know this, I am new to Elixir, but those numbers, those PIDs up there, if the first number is zero, it means it's the local one, and if it's another number, it's somebody else, somebody else on the network, in case you didn't know that. I didn't know that. I mean, I know it now, but there was one point in my life where I didn't know that. <laughs> And we can't all have Jose on iMessenger to explain this to us, so I'll tell you now. <laughs> anyway, so we're able to implement this con cell using, using a process. So it looks just like our Lambda version, except that we're able to wrap all of this up rather than in an environment, we're wrapping it inside of a process. So when we put together a list like this, one, two, three, four, each of these cells are stored on some random node within our system. So my theory, the Tenderlang theory, is that we're able to take processes and completely replace functions or lambdas with processes. And we're able to do this uh, lambda calculus, but only using, only using processes and make our language completely distributed. So we're, since we're able to implement if using lambdas, maybe we could implement if using processes. And we can actually get down to that fine grain language stored across all of the servers on our system, which would be super fun to debug. <laughs> so our fully, I can say that our fully distributed tenderlang is accomplished. So at the end of this, we're, we're, we've discussed this a lot. I said at the beginning, we, we need to talk about what makes Elixir special. So I want to talk a little bit about what makes Elixir special, and this is this is my sales pitch, sales pitch for you, which I know is a very tough audience to sell Elixir to. <laughs> so um, it's true that I implement this. I, I always implement this language, this lambda calculus, in every language that I come across. And we've taken it way farther than I typically do in any particular language. Uh, but I, I love to do this, and I love messing with languages, especially functional programming languages. Now. I actually talked to Jose about this, and he said to me, he kept saying to me, don't, don't sell Elixir as an FP language, because there's lots of functional programming languages out there. And I totally disagree with him. <laughs> there are many functional programming languages out there, but Elixir is one of the best ones that I've come across. It's so easy to use. It's a, it's a great FP language. Uh, if any of you have used, well, let's just put it this way. Other FP languages are terrible. So, <laughs> so I think it's appropriate to sell this as an FP language. It has amazing syntax. It's so easy to use. 
As somebody, I, I love to recommend, so, okay, I have to admit, my, my very favorite functional programming language is Scheme. I love using Scheme. But my dream is to come across a functional programming language that has no parentheses in it. Which is why I really enjoy Elixir, except that I was writing all of my code without parentheses, and then I was posting it online, and everybody was like, oh, you need to put parentheses on your function definitions. And I'm like, what? No! You're ruining my dream! <laughs> Please stop! <laughs> and then Mix, now it's putting parentheses on everything. But it puts parentheses, it puts parentheses on functions, but it doesn't put them on lambdas. And we just saw that lambdas are essentially functions, so why do we make that distinction? The same with with, and th this, these types of inconsistencies confuse me and make me frustrated, uh, but I think maybe I'm the only one that thinks about it that way. Anyway, so Elixir is a scheme with very few parentheses. We'll put it that way. <laughs> Fewer parentheses. So I think it has amazing syntax, but the other thing that I really enjoy about using this language is OTP. Uh, Jose told me that I should be selling Elixir because of its OTP capabilities, and I think he's right. There's no other language that has this type of uh, communication system built into it that's so robust and so easy to use. Uh, and imagine using OTP in a different programming language. Imagine trying to implement this in, in some other programming language. It would not be fun. It would not be fun to write. This is a language that gives us inter-process communication, distributed communication in a way that's actually fun and easy to use. So it is, th this is a really great way of selling the language as well. Uh, and the, the, final, the final way that I think that we should, or the final reason that I really, really love this language is uh, I think that Jose is great. And here is a photo of me trying to kiss him. <laughs> anyway, I think I, I want to end here. These are my thoughts about Elixir. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here.